and welcome back. Now today we're going to revisit a very old topic all about rotary encoders but don't get put off by the fact that you haven't used one yet. Um, my first video on rotary encoders, that's the one there on screen now, explains exactly how they work. So if you don't know how they work you really should watch that one first because I'm assuming you have some kind of base knowledge. Now the question you might be asking is, hang on Ralph, if you've already done one on rotary encoders why are you doing it again? And the fact of the matter is, we had a couple of comments under that video that made me think. I'm thinking, hmm, good points. Let's see what we can do. Right, first of all then, let's have a look at those comments to see what we're talking about. Now, this one here, which is by Killer Extreme, um, after thousands of people have seen the video, he posted this again. And he's obviously annoyed. So, Killer Extreme, whoever you are, don't worry. We all get frustrated at times. This code is buggy and it doesn't work, basically. Now, the reason it didn't work is because Killer Extreme was actually using a different type of rotary encoder. And in fact, if we scroll down, we might be able to see where he's talking about it. Here we are. So he's using a rotary encoder without detents, 96 pulses per rotation. Now, without detents, you say. Hmm. Okay, well, let's have a look at the, um, the original one then that uh, I was using. So this is the original one from video, I think it was video 19, wasn't it? And as you can see, when I turn this... There are very definite steps, right? As you can see, right? Now you could, of course, hold it and just squeeze it around so it doesn't quite click in, but it will always click into one of those little stops, right? So you get a little feedback. I mean, it's pretty typical of a rotary encoder. However, Killer Extreme was using one of these. Um, now this one, uh, is basically mechanically very similar to this. But you can move this any amount you want, and it doesn't sort of click into one of those stops. It's just free rotation. Now, this isn't like the one he's got, because he's got 96 steps per revolution. This one's 24. That's the best I could find, actually, for a stepless rotary encoder, um, which I could source from uh, it's Bournes, actually, who make this one. I'll show you the spec sheet, or at least include it in the video, if you're interested in a stepless one. And he was saying, basically, he wanted to capture each of the change states on each of the pins. What does that mean? Well, as I say, if you understand how rotary encoders work, we can have a look at this sheet here. This is a rotary encoder um, pin A and pin B signal. Now, just to recap quickly, pin A goes high, stays high for a bit, and then goes low as we turn the rotary encoder. Let's use the step one as an example. So as I turn that from one detent to another, that little step there, what's happening inside is that the pin goes up, cross, back down. In fact, this dotted line here is normally where the detent starts from and finishes at. So in fact, we're starting from this point here and we go to the same place in the next pulse to here so basically, pin has gone low, it stayed low for a while, come back up, and then come to rest here at the next detent or step. In the meantime, of course, pin B has done a very similar thing, but 90 degrees out of phase, which is how we know which direction we're turning it in. That's the whole point of the two signals on a rotary encoder, directional identification. So whereas a, a standard rotary encoder, like this one here that was used in the previous video, would leap all the way from here to here, and we'd only really want to detect when one of these pulses goes low, you could detect a rising pulse, um, but I've not found the Arduino to be particularly reliable on that. I mean, rising, what does rising mean? You know, at what point on here does it detect it? Whereas a low means it has to be, well, pretty much zero. Anyway, that's an aside and I've just found for reliability, it's easier on the Arduino to detect a low. So having detected the low, it then says, what's B doing at this time? Oh, it's high. Then we've got a 0 and a 1. That means we must be going in a clockwise direction. So having leapt from here to here, the Arduino kicks in at this point, runs this little bit of code, and by the time that step has come to rest here again, so by the time you've actually turned this from one place there to the next one along there, the codes run and it's incremented a counter or whatever. But what Killer Extreme is saying was, well, I've got this stepless one. A, there is no detent or no notion of this detent. So basically, 
you could be anywhere along this line and I want to detect this, I want to detect this, and this, and this, and this, and this, because then you get a greater resolution. Well, greater resolution you do get, but um, what I have found, in fact, is that, uh, I mean, this one's only 24 pulses a second. Now, pulse, what do we mean by pulse? Uh, if we go back to this, a pulse is one complete cycle. So in a detent situation, it'd be from here, to here that's one pulse but we're actually getting four pulses for the price of one on this one aren't we but to go through all those you're gonna have four pulses so why didn't it work for killer extreme he put this rotary encoder onto this sketch that's the original sketch pretty much why didn't it work he says um, it just kept running um, there was a little bit of confusion about what an interrupt routine did but we've cleared that up now well, the reason, first main reason why it didn't work is because unlike this one, there is no built-in pull-up resistors on this. It's just got the three pins, which is ground, which is that black one, plus A and B, effectively. Right, so there's no plus on here. There's nothing to bring these pins high, really. So they'd go low or floating. So maybe high, maybe not. So that's no good at all. So the obvious thing to do there is either to have a little bit of circuitry as I in fact have done here just to prove things that it's all going to work the same or even simpler in the original code simply change the input pins to input pull-up pins and then this would work exactly the same as this that is only detecting that low pulse on pin A and then it works identically but that's not what Killer Extreme wants. He wants to be able to take all pulses on here so that he has very, very fine control. Okay, okay. so we put a couple of pull-up resistors on here, basically to 5 volts. I've even got a couple of capacitors on here just to smooth out any spikes. I was just playing about and seeing what worked best. They didn't have a huge effect, to be quite honest. Let's um, have a look at the oscilloscope first to see how this looks and whether we can get what is in theory this can we get this to actually work on an oscilloscope okay that's coming up next right let's see what it looks like on the oscilloscope trace then as i now turn very slowly the rotary control in a clockwise manner and you can see that look, if i turn it a little bit faster you get more pulsing if i turn it slow you get more less right so that's one sweep now the thing we're looking for here on the top trace which is pin a um, you'll see here when it goes low what's pin B doing and as we can see very clearly as it's low pin B is high over here this goes low pin B is high doesn't matter how fast I turn it at the instant of pin A going low pin B is high pin A pin B pin A pin B so that's exactly what you'd expect on a clockwise um, turn so if we um, reset this and then turn it anti-clockwise we should see the exact opposite so here I'm going anti-clockwise now. Let's do it a little bit quicker because we're going to run out of room. All right, so. <clears throat> so now what we're saying is there's the falling edge of pin A and pin B is low. Falling edge, pin B is low. Even though it's a little bit squished in here, believe me, that's more than enough time for a, a computer or a microcontroller to say, yep, yeah, pin B was low. Uh, and there again, it's low 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 that means yes we're definitely going anti-clockwise now the point about the stepless one of course is that we should be able to um, trigger when pin b goes low as well so let's just let's just do that again clockwise in a slightly more smoother manner so what we're going to be looking at next is pin b the lower trace when that goes low what's pin A doing and as we can see here it's gone low and it's low here it's gone low and it's low here it's gone low and it's low so what that means is we're we are still turning in a clockwise manner so if we track both those states we're going to get more steps aren't we look so pin A goes low pin B is high that means I'm going clockwise then pin B goes low pin A is low that means I must be going clockwise as well and so on all the way through so you'd get two pulses for the price of one. Now if we, if we were to track also going high, like here to pin A and here on pin B, we could actually get four pulses, but I'm afraid 
the Arduino is not going to be very good at that because it can't track a high interrupt pulse only low falling and a change now we could do it on change potentially so whenever this state changes the pin state but then the logic becomes a little bit more complicated I'd like to get this working with at least two channels um, falling or not falling let's say when they are low so when pin A goes low when P go, pin B goes low I'd like to be able to detect what the other channel is so we get two pulses for the price of one okay that's the target now the the slight difference not that you're going to be making it out on here there's the rotary control here but all this gubbins here it actually we've actually wired it up somewhat differently so i'm going to have to draw that out so normally when you wire up a rotary encoder you just have the aeb pins and you have to provide a five volt somewhere so you can bring those amb pins up high pull up effectively but on the oscilloscope what i actually did was um connect the well what should be a ground to plus five volts i know it sounds weird and then just grounded a and b via 10k making them effectively pull downs but that was purely for the oscilloscope okay you wouldn't normally wire it out like this although nothing's to stop you well i think that proves then that the oscilloscope um, tracks those pulses quite happily and this works just as you might expect it to work well with this um, five volt pull-up arrangement or um, in your code all you'd have to have is that input to pull up on the pins but obviously you couldn't do that on the oscilloscope we had to actually supply it with some voltage so this this what would normally be a negative ground control actually went to positive on the uh, oscilloscope okay that's fine my next concern was well can we actually track that many pulses on an Arduino is it capable of tracking that many so the first bit of code I knocked up was a very simple pulse counter because when you turn this clockwise in a steady manner or anti-clockwise in a steady manner the number of pulses from A and B pins should be within one pulse of each other shouldn't they if we go back to our little diagram we can see here that if we're counting it's like one for A one for B one for A one for B the only time that gets out of sync is if you go one for A oh no I've changed my mind and going back in the other direction one for A oh no I've changed my mind and going back in the other direction one for A then it would get out of sync but just moving it steadily in one direction they should always be within one pulse count of each other why wouldn't that happen well if you turn this fast enough it might not register one of these pulses why not well you've got to think this is a mechanical device right how is that pulse actually being tracked well basically you've got a little bit of metal inside the thing so let's, let's greatly magnify let's assume this was a bit of metal this is the ground as that rotary knob goes around it's, it's moving this via cam or something like that up and down well you move it fast enough and what's going to happen it will start coming down but before it can actually make contact the next little notch or whatever has come up to bring it back up again so it hasn't actually made contact or it was so quick it was rejected by the program because it thinks it's a bounce what do we mean by bounce well even when this is making contact so it snaps back down and makes a contact like that there's a little bit of jitter like that at the bottom right so it goes snap jitter, jitter, jitter. now that little jitter up and down up and down only occurs for a maximum of five milliseconds how do i know that well it's in the data sheet we'll have a look at that in a sec um, but it it almost definitely does happen as it happens on every switch every button everything will have a little bit of jitter and whilst it all happens within five milliseconds to an Arduino that's an eternity it can detect that no trouble at all so we don't want to get all those pulses counted as one it's the main one we want to count and there's a second comment on the video we're going to be discussing in just a little while about that how we deal with that so let's see first whether or not the Arduino can actually detect four state changes then uh, without missing any pulses and see if they're within one or other right over to the code window then right here's a very simple circuit right now if you don't understand any of this please look at the previous video number 19 I think it is um, and just work out what this is doing I'll describe it in some detail but basically what we're doing here is coming into the interrupt routine down here right whenever there's a change and the reason we'll be coming into there when there's a change 
is because we said when there's a change, right? This is the marvelous thing about Arduino language. It, it spoon feeds you all this, doesn't it, really? But not just on pin A now, we're doing it on pin B as well. So there's a second interrupt. And luckily for us, the Arduino does support two interrupts, two and only two, unless you're going to go somewhere else with pin interrupts. Let's not talk about that. We're talking about hardware interrupts, standard pin two, pin three on the Arduino. That's the Uno or Nano. Obviously, the Mega's got many more. So we've got two identical interrupts. This is for pin B, right? And all it's doing is incrementing accounts. And here on pin A, it's also incrementing account. Now, if you look at this first bit, though, it's saying, if I've come in here too quickly after the previous time I was in here, it's got to be a bounce, or we're assuming it's a bounce. Let's put it that way. The bounce value, what am I using here? Well, as you can see, I'm saying 15 milliseconds, even though five should be plenty and it's indeed what I used in the original program. Um, but what I'm hoping is that the count stays the same. So let's have a look. Let's bring up the debug window or the serial monitor for this one. Let me see if I can bring that up on screen. Right, this is the debug window. So let's just um, reset that one. So it's uh, over here. Uh, reset. I'm actually running this on a Nano 168, but it makes no odds. Right, there's the debug window then. What we're now going to do is, um, oh, well, every two seconds it's displaying me the count of what A and B's have counted up to. So let's just uh, turn this. Oh, three, how did it get to three? Without me doing anything even. Right, let me just uh, reset that and uh, we'll, we'll start that. Right, start. Okay, now what I'm going to do is turn this very gently. So every two seconds it comes up on screen with what the the total is now as you can see it is within one count of each other they're either they're identical or one count difference that's fine now what happens if we if we turn it a lot I'll turn it lots 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 oh still good still good still counting up so and this is counting on every edge chain so as it rises that pulse and as it drops that pulse on both pins right it's it's counting up or down. If I turn it anti-clockwise, exactly the same will happen. So what this proves then is the Arduino is uh, more than capable of tracking those changes, except we've just seen here, look, it's gone a bit mad now. It says 299302, so it's actually missed a few pulses, so it's probably doing it too quick. Uh, now when we say doing it too quick, if we look at the um, data sheet for this one, in fact it's a generic one, but it applies to all the Bourne's type um, rotary encoders. So the bit we're interested on here is where it says down here. So we've got the contact pounce 5 million, but the 100 is the maximum RPM. Now, RPM of 100 is only a bit more uh, than, what, one a second. You can do 100 in a minute, so therefore you can do 1.6 in one second so if we were to start at the top there we'd have to take a whole second more or less and a bit more to get around to there that's pretty slow actually isn't it so if you spin it like that well that's going outside the parameters of what it says it can do so it's not surprising then that it goes wrong so that's the first thing to think about this rotary encoder or at least this brand of rotary encoder that if you start whizzing this up and down it's not going to detect every single pulse reliably. Okay, so back to the debug again for this one. Where are we on the code window? Right, so it's um, it's sort of changed a bit. What's it now? It's within three. Well, let me reset that again so we get back on track. And if we do it nice and gently. So there we are, I mean, that's pretty slow. More to the point, it's not just slow, it's being consistent, isn't it? So look, we're two out now, because I was, I was doing it too quick. So if you if you do even a quarter turn like that too quickly, that's the equivalent of, say, 200 RPM, so it will get out of step. Okay, so we've proven then that the Arduino at least can track it, but it's the hardware that limits how fast you can turn it, and it's 100 RPM max, which is slow. Okay, Okay, let's put a little sketch on here then to see if we can detect that uh, change in both directions and see how well it works. 
Right then, this is a, a simple little uh, program that you can see just behind this debugging window here. If I just turn that off a minute. So this little program here is, well, it just detects a change state really. Here we're saying that it is in fact uh, on change all right, for both pins. So if we bring back the debug window, which is that one. Right, okay, so it's saying both pins are high at the moment. Not that we particularly care at this time. We just want to know whether it's going to track it. Oh. So you little nudge look and you got it. It says up and down. Well, hmm. Okay, I'm turning it clockwise as you can see. So that should be up. And I'm doing it fairly gently because as we've already discovered, we just can't turn this too fast as it will miss a bounce or two. So that's up and turn it the other way. Down it goes. Oh, see there are a few ups in there. Look, look that's not right, is it? Something's definitely a bit awry there. Whether it's my code or theirs, I don't know. If we do it, now it's got confused. Look, it says down is now clockwise, when in fact it should be the other way. So it's going up that way and down that way. Why? Well, somewhere on the line, it missed a pulse. So now it thinks it's going in the wrong direction. But you can see the fragility of this code. I mean, you couldn't build this into a commercial unit, could you? Or even something you wanted to use at home. Let's change it again now. So we were going up one minute. And then suddenly it's decided we're going down instead, even though I haven't changed direction, I'm still going in a clockwise manner. I would personally query why you want that tiny look. I'm, I'm, I don't know if you can see this on camera, but I'm, be, I'm breathing on this, on this knob, and it's, it's going up and down like bananas, because if there's 24 complete cycles pulses on here, and I'm doing it on each edge at four per pulse isn't it so it's four times 24 if effectively right and it's it's just you know it's just too many i don't know what you'd use that for even on a say a digital power supply we are trying to adjust maybe a fine voltage you know you want to get it exactly 9.15 or something even this is it's just too much it just change it too much it'd be better i think just to detect the low going pulse on both pins perhaps but there we are. At least we've proven that the stepless one does work as long as you treat it nice and gently. But there are some caveats. Uh, maybe you guys out there um, know of a way to make this a little bit more stable. Believe me, though, I have tried various methods, both in my own code. I've tried libraries. I've tried ways of reading the pins directly rather than using the digital uh, read and stuff like that, using the pin D to snatch all the ports from a all the pins from a particular point in one go doesn't seem to make much difference to be quite honest this basically works if you do it slowly except now it's going in the wrong direction again but if you do it slowly it does it does sort of keep up and it's okay you do it any faster than that then things get well out of kilter but there we are so i'm hoping that killer extreme says hey it is working now or at least i can just turn those inputs into input pull-ups in the original code and it'll work just like this and frankly i think the resolution is probably enough but there we are that's not for me to say is it okay now the second comment then which uh, caused me to have a look at a few things is coming up next right i've had enough of the stepless rotary encoder we're moving now back to the original with um, a comment that the rain harvester made and it says i'll paraphrase what he's saying here he says basically your code tries to ignore bounces but if you were to get more bounces within a short time frame you'd treat the nth bounce as in fact a valid pin change state right um yeah i could see what he was saying although remember that the five milliseconds that uh, i chose was well, basically down to the spec sheet of the rotary encoder and I assume that five milliseconds would be enough that's the maximum remember okay but having said that I thought hmm what you're saying is correct technically it is correct if I had a bounce um, a number of bounces and the bounce came at six milliseconds or 5.1 milliseconds let's say my code would indeed treat that bounce as a valid input let's have a look at the code to find out why so this is now going back to the original code way back from well over a year ago when we we're doing that original uh, library uh, not library it's sketch so we're, this is the stepped um, one now right we can just just 
standard rotary encoder needs a 5 volt on here and if you haven't got a 5 volt on here you need to change the the uh, code to say input pull-ups rather than just inputs so okay let's have a look at this then so uh, scroll down a bit to see where the interrupt so this is the interrupt the single interrupt that we're using right because we're only tracking the low pulse now on pin a what it's saying is right we're keeping track of when we were last in here this bit at the top and we're saying well if we're coming in here more than five seconds five milliseconds ago <laughs> let's get that right five milliseconds ago uh, then that's fine i'm treating you as a as a pulse if you're not then you must be a bounce and it just comes out of this sketch and moves on let me just uh, tidy that up because i've been editing this this morning i'll uh, get that in line right so that's what's happening now what um what uh, the rain harvester um, is saying, he's saying, well, okay, if it's 5.1 seconds now and it was a, bowl, uh, a bounce, then it would come in here and treat it as a pulse. What he said is, why don't you move this bit here when we're keeping track outside the if condition, so down here, basically, and um, then you've got to have at least 5 milliseconds between pulses, at which point you can be fairly sure that you haven't got a bounce anymore because the, the bounces will occur within those five milliseconds at which point i thought hmm but that's going to make this less responsive if you can if you every single pulse now on here has got to be greater than five milliseconds from when the previous one was i thought hmm i bet that's going to slow things down and you know what in the real world uh, my car radio behaves just like that let's have a look at my car radio and how that behaves and then see if we can replicate that here and in fact if it does what i think it's going to do okay right see you in a bit right so this is a picture of my radio there's the volume control and as you can see it just goes round and round and round and round either way now when it does you'll see the volume here if i turn it left it just stays on zero when i turn it right it goes up right however if I spin it really quickly left, okay, it goes Are down to zero. To work? <laughs> That's my sat now thinking I'm going to work. Now, if I spin the volume control very quickly to the right, you'll see that it doesn't actually detect every single pulse because I do it nice and slowly to begin with. So it's say at number two now. <clears throat> and then if I spin it really quickly, look. It's actually gone down to one, in fact. I'll spin it again. This is clockwise I'm spinning it to turn it up. You will arrive at your destination at 12.32. Now, you saw there I spun it very quickly, but it only went up to about four. Let's do that again. Well, nothing at all that time. Uh, now it's gone up to some lights, whatever that said, anyway. Now, if I try and turn it down, say I wanted to mute the volume very quickly by turning it down here. If I really spin it, look. It's it's not going down to zero. It's on ten. I spin it, and well, sometimes nothing happens at all. Now it's down to eight. So I have to basically turn it quite gently up and down to get it to register. Now that's the problem I think we're going to have with the Arduino rotary encoder. So what we've discovered there then is that my car radio volume control does indeed skip pulses. Um, and occasionally, as you saw on there, um, it actually goes backwards when it should be going forwards. That's because, once again, you're spinning it so fast that uh, the contacts just can't keep up. They want to make a contact before they can actually make it. They're being pushed up again by the next detent or nudge or cam or whatever it's being used to move those, those things around. Uh, incidentally, an optical rotary encoder, which you can also get, but I'm not going to buy one, they're about 30 quid each, so I'm afraid you'll just have to guess how well they work, um, would have none of those problems, wouldn't have bounce at all, and I guess you could detect thousands of these per second, no trouble at all. Anyway, that aside, what we're saying is here then, this is my original code, where we have the last interrupt time within the main code, so as long as, long as the last pulse was greater than five milliseconds ago from the first time, it's going to treat the next one as kosher. So let's see what sort of response we get then on the uh, debug window. Let me bring the debug window up. There we are. So it says start. 
So if I just turn this now, so it says, yep, I'm going up. We started at 50. It's just a random figure by starting it. So it goes up fine and anti-clockwise it goes down again. That's not a trouble. Now, so if I turn this fast, yes, and it may well exceed the spec sheet for this, but we're trying to prove a point here, aren't we? If I go really fast, it's 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 not bad, is it? Responsible and back down again. So I'm turning it, you know, pretty fast. Look. So that's responding pretty well, I think, quite frankly. That's, that's not bad, is it? Yeah, it's catching all that. No bounces as far as we can tell. It's going up in, whoops, it's going up in, in steps of, of one. So the Arduino is nice and quick. It can catch them all. That's what I'm saying about reliability. You see, it's pretty good. And from a resolution point of view, if you were using this to tune a radio or a voltage on a uh, digital power supply, you know, this, this sort of amount of resolution is probably enough. But there we are. Horses for courses. Okay, that's fine then. So it's, it's catching all those. So let's go back to the code window now. Let's hide that debug window for now. So we're going to move this this code here. We're going to move that from there down to there. So it's outside of the if condition. Let me just tidy that up. Right. So what basically we've changed now to say, right, we've had a pulse. So it comes in here and goes, yeah, the last time you here was 10 minutes ago. That's fine. I'll run and keep track of when I ran. Another pulse comes in, it goes, oh no, I've you've been here within the last five milliseconds. I'm not I'm not doing anything, comes back out, keeps track of the time, comes back in, it goes, well no, you're only in here a tenth of a millisecond ago. I'm still not doing anything. Right? Because this is now being updated every time we come in here, whether or not we process that that signal, it says you've got to have a minimum now of five milliseconds between pulses. What difference is that going to make in the real world? Well, let's find out. Let me um, upload this first. So off it goes. Right. As soon as it comes up, I'll put the debug window back on. Right. I'm hoping that, let me just double check, make sure that really did upload. Yeah, it did. Okay, it's uploaded. Right, so start. So if we, if we turn this um, clockwise now. Oh. Well, it would help if I used the right rotary encoder. That was the other one. Right, so we're going to turn this clockwise. Up, 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 up. Yeah, so it's going up and down. Fine, so it's acting pretty much as it did last time. What happens then if we turn it nice and fast? Oh. Ah. Look at that, look. So 60, 60 is now. I spin it. It's probably 10, 20 pulses in that. And it goes up to 69. Right, 72. Not a lot, is it? And that's because that's now acting like my car radio is. It's basically has the same logic as what the code has here that we've changed it to now as a result of Rain Harvester's suggestion and says, no, we're only going to treat a pulse that's longer between pulses five milliseconds before it does anything. So it's interesting. Now, does it actually make it more reliable? Well, if the spec sheet says the bounces are all going to disappear within five milliseconds anyway, which is the milliseconds that I've used in the code. Uh, let me just, oh, I want to move this out of the way a little bit so that we can see both of them at the same time. So, there we are, you don't need to see me, do you? So there's, there's the five hard coded, just I know it's wrong, I shouldn't be using hard coded values, but there we are. Uh, so that's the five milliseconds. Um, so what we're saying is we're pretty sure now that all the poles have disappeared by then, but we're still only keeping track of everything that comes in here within five milliseconds or greater than five milliseconds. In fact, we're ignoring everything else. So does it actually make it more reliable? Well, I'm not sure. My radio irritates a little bit. In fact, this morning I dropped my wife off into town. So she goes shopping, and as I came out, I spun the volume control up because there was a song, and I wanted to get it loud, so I spun it, and the volume basically hardly moved. It went up by one or two, um, and it has to go up, you know, from say ten to twenty-five to make it appreciably louder. So I had to then turn it up a little bit slower, like that, in a more controlled manner. Now, whilst you might say. Do it in a more controlled manner, Ralph. Stop being so eager. Yeah, fine, I agree with that. But 
I don't know if this makes it any more reliable by ignoring those pulses. Look, that I'm now spilling in there like mad, or whether I'd like this this back where it was, so we get a more responsive rotary control. I guess it all depends on your project, doesn't it? Really, if I was redesigning my car radio, I would not have it like this because it's irritating. I'd have it back in this loop so that I can turn my car radio up and down from basically off, you know, muted to really loud just with a quick spin. Because I think you'd learn pretty quick not to spin it too much, but if you knew it was going to be responsive, you'd just go whack and that'd be it, you'd be up. Whereas this way, using the, the tracking of the time afterwards, means you have to do it in a much more controlled manner. Well, that's all very well and interesting. I don't know whether Rain Harvester is ever going to watch this and uh, learn something about it or why I've done it and what the effect is of doing it his way compared to my way. I'm easy with it and I can see there are benefits both ways. I think I've highlighted those. Uh, let me think um, what else I can tell you about on this. I think we've covered everything, haven't we? Um, there is one browser site I think is worth uh, looking at. If we go back to from there to here. Now this is Nick Gammon's page all about interrupts. And of course he's got a zillion. He is the guru of all things Arduino without a shadow of a doubt. He knows more about Arduino than I think Atmel know themselves, frankly. In fact, the Arduino um, people, arduino.cc, often refer to Nick Gammon's site because he just knows everything there is to know about it. Um, but on here he talks about interrupts in the nth degree, right? So if you're really interested in interrupts and how the Arduino can service them, you really need to read this. But as I say, it gets more and more involved as you go on. We're using things like this here, look at these, these names. It's, um, it's very interesting, and if you need to know about it, um, have a read. And in fact, even if you don't need to know about it, it's a bit like window shopping, isn't it? One day you might, so it's definitely worth a read. And I'm gonna put a link to Nick's page on the bottom of this video because it's uh, very interesting didn't help me particularly using rotary encoders or the other rotary encoder this one over here the stepless one but it was still a, a good read i think we've covered everything we need to cover now on rotary encoders and stepless ones and the four bits and everything else that come out of them great hope you enjoyed it learned something thanks for watching see you in the next video i hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting there are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.